want to welcome you to week number three of our From This Day Forward series. And our theme verse for this series is found in Lamentations chapter 3. And it may seem like a puzzling verse, especially for a message today called Have Fun. But uh, let's read through this and see why it's our theme verse. First he says, this is Jeremiah. He says, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. And today as we come to the topic of have fun in marriage, I I recognize there's probably no other area in our lives where we have more affliction, more bitterness, more gall, more downcast feelings than in the area of our sexuality. A sex handled properly within the confines of the biblical marriage relationship is one of the greatest gifts that God's ever given to us. Sex mishandled causes some of our greatest pain. And I could regale you today with the statistics on the the sexual abuse of girls and boys in our culture today. I could relate to damage that's done in our hearts and minds through porn and obscenity in, in the entertainment industry. Uh, the damage that's done to our emotions through our dating culture. I mean, we have taken God's greatest gift to us and we have trashed it through our wanderings. The statistics on this are just heartbreaking, even frightening. But really, it doesn't matter how many people have experienced this pain because the only statistic that really matters is the statistic of one. What matters to you, what matters to me, is what's happened in my own heart and life. And that's why the next verse is so important. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. No matter what I've done, no matter what's been done to me, say those three words with me, I have hope. When Jeremiah wrote Lamentations, he wasn't lamenting a bad hair day. He was writing this because the city of Jerusalem had been destroyed. His nation had been decimated, his people slaughtered, the survivors were carried off into foreign lands as slaves. Jeremiah had his teeth knocked out to where he was spitting them out like gravel. He'd been cast into the bottom of a well and sunk in the mud up to his neck. I mean, the background to this lament is horrific. And Jeremiah would understand the horror, the abuse, the pain that you've experienced in your life. And whether your pain is from your own bad choices and wanderings or whether your pain is from the evil choices that have been inflicted on you by other people, Jeremiah, God, understands your pain. And he's telling you today, there's hope. There is hope. Why? Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Circle that phrase. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Today I want to offer you a message of hope. Whatever mistakes, whatever sexual trauma you have experienced in the past, God offers you hope, healing, and health from this day forward. And the way you find that hope, healing, and health is by doing the five things that God tells us to do in our marriage. The hope we have in our marriage is to do marriage God's way. You follow the world's way and the odds are against you. You follow God's way and God is with you. The the more we wander from God's pattern for marriage, the worse our marriages get. The closer we get to God's pattern, the better our marriage gets. And the way we get closer to God's way of doing marriage is to commit to the five things in this series. The first first week we learned that we must seek God, that the foundation of our marriage relationship must be God first. And last week we looked at how to fight fair. There's a way to fight in your marriage that is constructive, not destructive. God give us the rules of engagement. This week we're going to look at how to have fun in your marriage. God wants you to have fun in your marriage. Next week, we're going to look at how to stay pure, because if we fall for the subtle or not so subtle traps of the world, we're going to find ourselves wounded and defrauded by the world, and our marriages will be at risk. And the last week in the series is never give up. Till death do us part is not an escape clause. Till death do us part is a promise that God gives us of a healthy, happy, hopeful marriage through every season of life. 
you're going to, if your marriage is going to succeed, if your family is going to succeed, if, frankly, if we as a church, if as a culture, if as a country, if we're going to succeed, we have to make a choice. The choice is which way are we going to go? And God lays that choice out for us in Deuteronomy 30, 19. It says, this day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. You, know, you may look at your life and think you're a victim of your circumstances, but God offers you something more hopeful than that. God offers you choices. God says, you get to choose between life and death, blessings and and curses. You get to choose the direction of your life, and God encourages you, now choose life. Choose life. God wants you to choose a life-giving environment for your marriage, for your family, for your life, so that you and your children may live. When you choose a life-giving attitude, it impacts all your relationships. And that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. Read the last phrase with me. For the Lord is your life. The Lord is your life. You want blessings and success in your marriage? It starts with recognizing that the Lord is your life. Uh, On your notes, on the screen, foundational principles about this. Life-giving relationships look to God as the source of their life. I can't put that pressure on another person. I can't put the pressure on another person to make me happy because they don't have the power, they don't have the capacity to do that. And the flip side of that is, is I, I can't let another person make me miserable. They don't have the, the power or the capacity to do that unless I give it to them. The truth is, too many of us are doing exactly that. We are looking to our spouse to make us happy. I mean, do I make Katie happy? No. She was happy before we ever got together. Does she make me happy? No. I find my happiness in my relationship with God. And then we come together happy. Not because of each other, sometimes in spite of each other. Because we aren't depending on each other for our happiness. We're depending on God. Let God be the source of your life needs. Don't put all that pressure on your spouse. They can't deliver. They can't deliver. And don't let them make you miserable. If they're making you miserable, you are giving them a power that they're not supposed to even have. Singles, don't go looking for some other person to make you happy. Get happy in God so that you're happy when the other person shows up. Don't look to another person to complete you. Find your completion in God so you're complete when the other person shows up. And then you'll have a marriage based on the abundant life that Christ offers you instead of a marriage based on your dependency and need on somebody who can't meet it. Look to God as your life source, not another person. Life-giving relationships happen when two servants are in love. When God is the one who completes me, when God is the source of my life, then I'm able to offer out of God's abundance. I'm able to offer to my spouse rather than to seek to consume or drain from my spouse. That's the miracle of Christianity. It's the miracle of Christian marriage. Because of my relationship with Christ, I have a strength that doesn't come from me. I have a fountain of life, I have a bread of life, I have a spirit of life that fills me up and overflows into the lives of others. So instead of attaching myself to my spouse, desperately sucking the life out of them, I'm able to come as a servant. I'm able to come to my spouse and offer to her out of the abundance that Christ has given me. Great relationships happen when two servants are in love. Because then it's a battle of who can outserve the other one. Who, who, how, how much better to do marriage that way, you know, to, to be offering out of the abundance that Christ has given you, rather than trying to drain somebody else dry. And the power of God can actually give you the ability to do that every day from this day forward. That leads to the third principle. Life-giving relationships make the choice every day. Every day, from this day forward till death do us part, now choose 
life. I choose to let God meet my life needs. Not another person, not my spouse. Every day I choose to serve the people in my life out of that abundance, including especially my spouse. I don't need them to serve me. God's meeting my needs. But out of that abundance, I want to serve her. I want to serve other people. And I choose to do that every day from this day forward till death do us part. Because it it doesn't happen on its own. But today, today I want you to understand that from this day forward, God wants you and your wife, God wants you and your husband to have fun. He really does. Ecclesiastes 9, look at this, says, live happily with the woman you love. Man, do you realize that God wants you to live happily with your wife? Ladies, do, do you realize that God's plan, God's desire for your marriage is that you will enjoy life with your husband through all the meaningless days of life that God has given you under the sun. The wife God gives you is your reward for all your earthly toil. You know, life can seem meaningless. Life is full of toil. Life comes with all kinds of difficult and hard and horrible seasons. But in the midst of all this struggle and strife, God wants you to enjoy life with your wife, with your husband. How do we get there? Well, I want us to go back to a concept that we focused on in our detox series. And that's the concept that we are tripartite beings. We each have a body, a soul, and a spirit. We each have a body. Our our body is formed at conception. Life begins at conception. That's the physical part of us. And our body appears when we're born. And then we experience the physical aspects of life through our body. We each have a soul. There's an immaterial part of us. There's an invisible part of us. It's our mind, our intellect, our emotions, our will, our personality. And then when we trust in Jesus Christ... We each have a spiritual part of us that comes alive when we trust in Christ. So we have a body, a soul, and a spirit, three parts. And God wants us in our marriages to connect all three parts. In our marriages, we are to have fun in all three areas. And the problem comes when we focus on one area and neglect the others. If you're truly going to enjoy life with the wife and husband that you love, you need to have fun in all three areas. What are they? First of all, you need to have fun emotionally. Emotionally. You have a soul part of you that long before you get to the physical, sexual part of the relationship, you have an emotional part that needs to have fun in your marriage. The soul part of you needs to be fed and nurtured. And one of the ways you can build someone up emotionally and one of the ways you can tear them down emotionally is with your words. Words. Most people's emotional tank is filled or emptied by words. The Bible says that the power of life and death is in the tongue. I mean, you think about the church experience. I mean, we come here, we sing words. I speak words. You hear words. You write down words. We read words. Hopefully, hopefully the words that encourage and build you up and help you to see God differently, to see life and hope and help in God, to look at your spouse differently and to see how God wants you to live. It's all, all, it's all words. That's what 1 Peter talks about. It says, finally, all of you, well, that would include husbands and wives, live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. Yet how many of our homes look like that? We're not filling the emotional tank. We're draining it. We're destroying it, poking holes in it with the words that we say through insults and one-liners and put-downs and criticism and negativity and nagging. What do we do to correct it? I mean, we've got to to learn to break the cycle. Notice it says, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. Do not repay. It's like God knows in our sinfulness it's going to happen. But he says, listen, when it happens, you've got to break the cycle. Don't repay, but with blessing. Because to this you were called. This is your calling. Your calling is to speak blessing into the life of your family. 
And some people don't understand why their life is meaningless and joyless and, and why their marriage falls so far short of, uh, of their expectations. It's because of the words that are coming out of your mouth. If your words are constant whining and criticism and negativity, if your word, words are coarse and rude and obscene, you're your own worst enemy. You're your own worst nightmare. You, you, you need to stop. You need to shut your mouth to cursing and criticizing and negative talk, and you need to fill, fill your mouth with blessing. It's what you've been called to. Why? Because then you will inherit a blessing. And this is true, this is true for both men and women, but in in different ways. Both men and women have a gate through which intimacy comes to them. For women, the primary gate of intimacy is through the ears. That's why women just love conversation. The way to a woman's heart is through her ears. It's the words that you speak to her. And women also like to be heard. You guys, your wife loves it when you listen to her. Just the simple act of speaking kind words and listening to her words just fills her emotional tank. And ladies, there's there's a flip side to this word thing. Just as in a woman's emotional tank is filled by words, a guy's emotional tank can be drained by words. Can be drained by words. Guys can be very blunt, very crushing with their words. Ladies can be very cutting with their words. If a guy's words are a sledgehammer, a woman's words can be a scalpel that cuts to the heart. The Bible says it's better to live alone in the desert than with a quarrelsome, nagging wife. Better to live on a corner of the roof than share a house with a nagging wife. If you want to hear nice words, you need to speak nice words. Because words can fill or drain your marriage emotionally. And positive words fill it up with joy, and negative words will fill it with poison. Emotional fun. It is just so crucial in marriage. It's crucial in family. And one of, the, one of the great things we've learned over the years is just to ask in our family. Great question. Just every night, just say, did anything funny happen at work or at school today? Because if you come home from work and school and you spend your evening grousing and grumping and, and griping about everything and everyone that happened, you're poisoning your marriage and your family with bitterness. You're draining the life and fun out of your family. But if you spend your evening laughing and joking... And telling stories, you will refill the emotional tanks of every person in your home. You will enjoy life with the wife and husband that you love. If you need to vent the bad stuff of the day, do that to God in the car on the way home. God's happy to hear it. He can bear it. He can handle it. God can do something about it. You know, you get home and dump a load of bad attitude on your spouse. What's she supposed to do about that situation at work? She has no ability to do anything about it. It's a load that she was never meant to bear. So lay it on God and then just fill her up with what are the fun things that happened today. Emotional fun. It's crucial. Second, we need to have physical fun. And the world's selling you a pack of lies on on this in the area of life and marriage. The world is trying to convince you that the only thing that matters in this area is your physical satisfaction. The world wants to separate the physical and the emotional, certainly the physical and spiritual aspects of this. And that's not going to work. God's standard for physical fun is one man, one woman in marriage. One man, one woman in marriage. I don't care what culture says. I don't care what the government says. Listen, it's not the first time that culture and government have ever been wrong. They can't even decide if eggs are good for me or not. Okay? The, the culture, the government did not create you. God created you. And God knows what's best for you. And God wants what's best for you. God wants what's best for you. God is the one who put pleasure in sexuality. The the pleasure part was God's idea, and God's intention was that marriage would be fun physically. Proverbs 5 says, May your fountain be blessed. A little insight into Scripture. Throughout Scripture, the Bible refers to the male anatomy as a fountain and the female anatomy as a well. May your fountain be blessed. 
May you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. God's the one who wrote that passage. I didn't write that. I just really, really like it. <laughs> you know, the Bible, but the Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon, chapter 4, chapter, chapter 4 is the honeymoon night. It says, your two breasts are like twin fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. Throughout passages of scripture, it uses this deer thing as imagery for the sexual thing. And honestly, that's something that every guy in Missouri understands. Okay? I mean, you know, I mean, guys, you just need to be careful about your approach when it comes to sexuality. Because great sex is tender. Great sex is affirming. It's gentle. I mean, if you're hunting deer, you tiptoe to the deer stand. (laughs) You know, you don't just jump into the forest. Hey, I'm here! I mean, you know, you do that, your hunt is over. Okay? And I don't know how many times, guys, you've experienced that on on a date night with your spouse. When I'm out on a date night, I tell you, through date day, I'm just on pins and needles. I mean, you're out for a nice meal, maybe an activity, some shopping, stop at Starbucks. I mean, all day, all night, I'm just praying, God, please don't let me say anything stupid. (laughs) Please don't let me do anything loud to spook her. Please don't let me do anything stupid. You know, you're in a restaurant, and you're going with another guy over there with his wife, and you're like... Be very quiet. I'm hunting wabbit. Because you don't want to spook her. Because the evening's over. Guys, don't do anything that cheapens the relationship. I'm just appalled in our day at the stuff on TV and books and movies and, and the internet that demeans and cheapens the sexual experience. Sex is something to be cherished, not cheapened. And the physical aspect of marriage is to be tender, affectionate, affirming. It's holy is what it is. It's spiritual. Now, women, if men need to be careful with their approach, ladies, you just need to make an approach. Just have one. He won't care. (laughs) Just have one. I mean, if, if ladies have an ear gate, guys have an eye gate. And if women are aroused by what they hear, men are aroused by what they see. And I know your grandmother's flannel is warm and comfy. But you got to include some silk and satin in there somewhere. You know, women get very self-conscious about their appearance. But you, you are the one. You are the one that he's chosen to focus his life on. And, and if you don't let him see you, where's he going to look? Where's he going to look? I mean, let him look at you. And then cover yourself up for everybody else. Okay? Guys, you need to be careful with your approach. Your wife needs to feel cherished, not cheapened. And ladies, you just need to make an approach. Make yourself available and accessible to him. If you just both earnestly do, do that, just make an effort in this area, God promises that he'll bring you together in a delightfully intoxicating way. The emotional aspect of your marriage relationship needs to be tended to. You need to speak to one another from the heart with positive, encouraging words that build each other up. The physical aspect of your marriage relationship, it needs to be tended to. And you need to be proactive on the physical side because that's that's an area that needs to be filled and nurtured. Be careful how much denying is going on because that frustrates and it pushes toward toward other outlets. You've got to be very, very careful with that. And I'm not saying that you need to be doing stuff that's wild and crazy, but you need to be doing something. You need to be something that that is mutually enjoyable and satisfying for each other. Because God wants you to have physical fun. Next, the spiritual aspect of your marriage relationship needs to be tended to. This one often gets overlooked. You, You need to have spiritual fun. Brothers and sisters, you are holy partners in a heavenly calling. Husbands and wives, God designed the two of you together to make a spiritual difference here on earth. 
And you're missing out on a third of the fun that God wants you to experience if you aren't serving God together. That's why at Rockbrook, around here we call it work one, worship one. And it's just a very high value for us. The idea is that in one service you worship together, in another service you work together. And maybe it's in Rockbrook for kids, maybe it's as greeters in the info table or baptism team, maybe it's leading a small group. And we have 13 dream teams, 13 teams that it takes to make the weekend happen. And the way you get on a dream team is by completing growth track. And, and let me just tell you, you know, I, I push this growth track dream team thing. I'm not telling you to get involved because we need you. I'm not telling you to do this out of our need. I'm telling you to do this out of your need. Yes, the church would function better with your help. But I don't tell you this out, out of our need. It's just as a pastor, I've learned, I learned a long time ago, the best way to meet your needs is to grow you up in Christ to the point where you're just filled to an an abundance. And you're filled to an abundance that it just pours over into the life of other people through ministry. And and you just got to get out and and you've got to serve other people because you're just so full of Christ. Jesus says that if you want to be great, if you want a great life, a great marriage, a great family, if you want to be great, you got to be the servant of all. The servant of all. In, in 41, almost 42 years of marriage, for Katie and I, a couple, for our whole family, one of our great sources of spiritual fun has been ministering together in the church. One of the great sources of fun in our marriage is, is conferences and concerts and just spiritual activity uh, here at church. It's added so much joy, so much depth to our lives, to our marriage, to our family. Why? Because God wants us to have fun, body, soul, and spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. God's plan for you is that you would enjoy life with the wife, with the husband that you love. And maybe you're here today and maybe that's just not what's happening. Maybe it's dried up. Maybe you just think, man, the thrill is gone. I mean, I, I, you know, it's just, it's not happy. It's not fun. It's just more suffering. It's more toil. It's more meaningless. And I just want to tell you, there's hope. There really is hope. God promises that if you'll move to the things that that he's telling you to do, if you'll seek God, if you'll fight fair, if you'll have fun, if you'll stay pure, if you'll never give up, if you'll seek to, to, to commit, just commit to having fun emotionally, physically, spiritually with one another, God will bless you with a great life. And the, and the thing is, is that the choices lead and the feelings follow. God tells you, now choose life. Make the right choices and the right feelings will follow. Don't get that turned around. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your wonderful love for us. We thank you for your wisdom, the plan that you have for us, for the gift of marriage. God, I just thank you for the gift of emotional, physical, and spiritual fun. That your desire is just to bless us beyond, to intoxicate us with one another. God, I would pray that you'd help our couples to to seek to do those things, to build those values, those activities, those choices into their life every day, from this day forward, till death do us part. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.